Hello, you fire net folks. Today, we're talking about Hot Chips 2025. Also known as Hot Chips 37. Now, unfortunately, I was unable to record at Stanford. Wish I could have, but unfortunately, it got really, really busy over the week. Had many great conversations with folks and to everybody who I met. It was wonderful meeting y'all. So, I would like to talk about the first session at Hot Chips, which was all about CPUs. And we had talks from Condor Computing about their upcoming uh, RISC-V CPU core, which is RVA23 compatible and is codenamed Cusco. PZ, spelled P-E-Z-Y, talked about their upcoming SC4 chip, which is an HPC-focused chip, which is nice to see. IBM talked about their, uh, their already shipping Power 11 chip, which we also had an interview with the presenter, Bill Starkey, uh, on the channel at SC24. So if you want to go check that out, uh, the video will be linked in the description below. And last but not least, Intel talked about their upcoming eCore-based Xeon, codenamed Clearwater Forest. So let's get right into it. Starting with the first presentation of the day, Condor, a kind of skunk works division of Andy's Computing, talked about their new core IP codenamed Cusco. Cusco is a RVA23 compatible core, which is out of order, has a 10 stage mispredict pipeline, is eight wide at the decoder, has eight wide execution, and uniquely to the core, is sliced up into slices. Now, there are four slices per Cusco core. Each of these slices, which are the same execution units, each have two ALUs, one int mole unit, one int div unit, 128-bit FMA unit, and one load and store unit. In order to get the those four slices operating at their optimal, Cusco has implemented what Condor is calling the time resource matrix, or the TRM. What the TRM does is track the usage of the core's resources, resources such as the ALUs, execution ports, buses, etc. While the TRM can look up to 256 cycles into the future, the same size as the reorder buffer, in order to not have a very expensive matrix, uh, Condor has decided that an eight cycle window is the appropriate size for what the TRM should be looking at. Now, in theory, this could be a limitation of the uh, TRM because the TRM does assume an L1D hit and the core does use replays in order to uh, deal with an L1 miss. Stalls caused by the eight cycle window is likely to be fairly rare and you'll probably hit other uh, resource limits of the core. This schema allows for the Cusco core to be a fairly compact core considering the execution resources available. The core on TSMC N5 is approximately 1.3 millimeters square with a 64K L1i and a 64K L1d, capable of 64 bytes per cycle, assuming vector usage, and a target clock of approximately 2.5 gigahertz. So... Moving on to the second presentation of the day, and that is from PZ about their SC4 solution. PZ is a Japanese HPC company that uh, ran afoul of the Japanese government several years ago, where the former CEO and a couple other workers were arrested and convicted of fraud of the Japanese government. So while everybody had been assuming that they had gone under, here at Hot Chips 2025, they proved everybody wrong. With over 24 teraflops of FP64 performance and approximately 3.2 terabytes of memory bandwidth uh, via 96 gigabytes of HBM3, the SC4 has quite high bytes per flop ratio compared to some other HPC GPUs. 
Not to say that PZ is a GPU, but it kind of looks like one from a high-level perspective. And moving on to the architecture, it is a MIDI architecture or multiple instruction, multiple data. MIDI, you can think of as SMT sort of, and is sort of the similar schema where you issue multiple instructions and you get multiple pieces of data out from the core at the same time. The SC4 has 2048 cores called processor elements or PEs and 16,384 threads. Yes, you can consider this SMT8 for you SMT8 fans out there. Each PE has four kilobytes of L1i and four kilobytes of L1d and a 24K local storage scratch pad similar to AMD's LDS. And the PEs are clocking in about 1.5 gigahertz. Moving up from above the PE is the village, which is which consists of four PEs, which all share local memory storage between the four. Then there are four villages in a city which have 32K of L1i and 64K of L1 of L2D, which is interesting. Again, an L1I, uh, L2I and L2D split, we don't see that very often. So it is unique to see it here in this processor. Then there's 18 cities at a prefecture, two of which are disabled for yield reasons. And then moving up to the final level, there is the state. The state has eight prefectures and share a 64 megabyte LLC. This is all connected by a crossbar that's capable of up to 12 terabytes per second of reads and six terabytes per second of writes. And like I said, it does kind of look like a GPU and it kind of acts like a GPU and it kind of feels like a GPU, but it's not quite a GPU. It is in its own category. Now, moving on to the third presentation of the day from IBM, who, like I said at the top, we interviewed the presenter, Bill Starkey, at SC24. What? And so from that interview, we know that there aren't many changes to the core from po in Power 11. The biggest change in Power 11 is the packaging. Now, I believe that this is the first time that it's been publicly announced that somebody is shipping a Samsung made interposer, which is for improved power delivery to the P11 chip. The new interposer has what IBM is calling integrated stack capacitors or ISCs. ISCs effectively do this a very similar job to deep trench capacitors or DTCs if you're familiar with those, which smooth out the power delivery to a processor. Usually you'll find these in something like an MI300X or a B200. Why IBM is using it, using this sort of technology here is in order to reduce voltage spikes in order to increase reliability so that the Power 11 chip can help hit that six nines of reliability However, what's interesting is the new interposer has not affected the DCM packaging. So for power, IBM has two different packages, one with a single die and one with two dies. And the two die module, the packaging for that has not been affected by the new interposer, which is quite interesting. Now, moving on to the second major improvement in Power 11, and that is the improved or my interface, or open memory interface and buff buffer chip. Starting with the RMI interface on the P11 chip, while Power 11 did not add any new lanes, IBM is now clocking the FIs at 32 gigatransfers per second, which is up from 25.6 gigatransfers in Power 11. So now P11 can read up to 512 gigabytes per second per direction from the RMI buffers. Speaking of the RMI buffers, the RMI buffers themselves have had a major increase by moving from a single read and write port to a dual port scheme, 
along with increasing the per port bandwidth by 50%, which has given the new OMI buffer up to 76.8 gigabytes per second of bandwidth to the memory chips, which is a 3x increase from the 25.6 gigabytes per second that the prior OAM chip had. This gives the total aggregate P11 socket up to about 11, 1200, excuse me, 1200 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth from the OMI buffer to the memory chips on the DDIM. Well, and what's really interesting is that despite this being a serial memory interface, which usually adds quite a bit of latency, Bill on stage said this adds approximately six to eight nanoseconds of latency, which for memory is not quite within the noise, but very low, which is nice to see. And while IBM is the only one using this technology for now, they have given this technology over to the CXL consortium and essentially given it to the community to go use. And hopefully we'll see more companies and chip makers use OAM in the future due to the complexity of adding more and more parallel DDR interfaces to chips. And now, last but not least, Intel. Intel at Hot Chips 2025 talked about their next-gen E-Core Xeon, codenamed Clearwater Forest. Starting with the CPU core, it is a derivative off of SkyMont, which is the E-Core found in Alder Lake and Lunar Lake. Just like Alder Lake and Lunar Lake, four cores share a 4 megabyte L2. But what is different here is the packaging. Clearwater Forest has is now 3D stacked. And it's not 3D stacking like Lakefield. It is 3D stacking with hybrid bonding. So they're using a 9 micron pitch Fulveros technology. Same pitch as AMD uses for its 3D B-cache to connect the compute dies, four compute dies, down to a base tile. And those three, and there are three base tiles per Clearwater Forest. And each of those base tiles are connected via 45 micron EMIB, just like how the compute dies in Granite Rapids are all connected. This allows for a unified 576 megabyte L3, which is accessible by all 288 cores on Clearwater Forest. However, there is a bit of a downside, and that is a four core cluster can only get about 35 gigabytes per second out of the L3 in memory. Or out of the base side, really, you should think of it. Um, and that 35 gigabytes per second has to deal with L3 traffic along with any traffic in between clusters on the compute die. Even within a compute die, due to there not being a uh, connection between the cores on the compute die other than through the L3. So if cluster one needs to talk to cluster three, you go from cluster one down to the L3, across and back up to cluster three. Cool. And about that 35 gigabyte figure, that could be a latency limited figure for Arrow Lake a single SkyMount cluster is able to pull just over 80 gigabytes per second from the L3, which suggests that the mesh is either run at a very low clock or that the uh, mesh is much higher cycle latency than the ring that Aerolink uses. Likely a both are, are contributing here. Moving up to the platform level, Clearwater Forest is reusing the same I.O. dies as Granite Rapids. So the platform is not changing, nor is the socket. This is still using the LGA 7526 socket, just like Granite Rapids AP is. However, there is one very big upgrade, and that is that Clearwater Forest can now support DDR5 RDIMs at 1,000 megatransfers per second, 
which nets you up to a total of 768 gigabytes per second of memory so of memory bandwidth per socket. So that is a not so quick run of the presentations of the CPU section at Hot Chips 2025. Hope you all enjoy. Uh, if you'd like to contribute to Chips and Cheese, uh, there is the Patreon, the PayPal, and the Substack if you'd like to subscribe to those. And if you like this video, of course, subscribe and hit the bell. Unfortunately, that does help with the algorithm. But until next time, have a good one, folks.